Uh, welcome everybody. Welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. You're in the San Francisco Dharma, Dharma Collective Zoom classroom here. And we are about to embark on part three of our look at the Akshayamati Bodhisattva Sutra. Uh, Bodhisattva, inexhaustible mind, inexhaustible wisdom. Um, if you have any questions about the Bodhisattva, inexhaustible wisdom, or how we got here, please refer to part one and two. Um, as you can see, there's been a lot of development <laughs> since last time. Uh, the roots, the roots of virtue have matured. Uh, and so I'm, I'll at some point get to explaining this. Um, uh, what's on the whiteboard here? Um, like I've said, I said last time, this is a pretty straightforward sutra as far as it's, there's no big uh, narrative, not a lot of narrative moments, uh, uh, but it's a great sutra for exploring the path. It's a great sutra for exploring the Bodhisattva path, the Buddhist path, the practice of Dharma. Um, it's why I actually chose this sutra Eve, again, even though it's not as exciting in a narrative sense, it's so rich as far as practice goes. Um, part one and part two, we basically covered these 10 paramitas, the perfections, uh, excellences, deliverances. There's a lot of different ways you could translate the term paramita, uh, but these are them. Uh, giving, moral discipline, patience, determination, or as I have it, drive, meditation, but I'm going with dhyana, a specific type of meditation, pranya, not just wisdom, but a unique form of Buddhist wisdom, pranya, and then our upaya, our power, our devotion, and then finally this great knowledge. These are the 10, uh, you can think of them as virtues or practices, qualities, but these are the 10 aspects of the Bodhisattva path. And this sutra is about that. Um, and so really uh, part one and part two were just laying out the 10 paramitas, <laughs> like in general. And as you can see today, we have a veritable matrix of the Dharma up on the board here. And that is because the next part of the sutra is um, these sort of 10 foremost uh, practices. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's these dharmas, they're called dharmas. And so again, as always, Dean's in the room, so right? <laughs> so as always, this term dharma is going to be used a bunch of different ways. It kind of means practice, but it's also an object of practice in that way, like the object of awareness versus the practice of awareness. So it's going to be a little tricky, but I don't want to get too hung up on that. But the idea here is, is that for each of the paramitas, there's going to be 10 dharmas associated with it. And that's right giving us a grand total of a hundred dharmas. Um, I'm, I don't think I'm gonna get through all hundred dharmas tonight. Um, uh, like I said at the uh, at part one, I have no agenda for how fast this will go. So we're just gonna take it at, just at the pace that it needs to take. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and dive in. Uh, I'll just uh, repeat the, the last part, which is, after the Buddha answers Bodhisattva Akshayamati's question, his question is, of course, how do you, uh, what is enlightenment? How would one develop a mind of enlightenment? How, how do you get enlightened? The Buddha's answer is, well, observe, practice these 10 paramitas. And so then if you had the question, well, great, I'm in. I'm in, I, I'm in for enlightenment. How do I practice these 10? That's what we're here to talk about tonight. 
And so again, the Buddha says, uh, virtuous one, one who succeeds in observing these 10 kinds of uh, initiation or generation of enlightenment, that person is called a bodhisattva. That person is called a supreme being, a being without obstruction or hindrance, not an inferior being. And then it says this kind of funny thing in the end, which is basically, but yet in, re in reality, there is no such thing as a sentient being. Of course, there is no bodhisattva, no practice of the bodhisattva. So we always have that, that great <laughs> pranya ending to most of these things so that we don't get too hung up on uh, subject-object relationships. All right. Um, but again, that's just saying that somebody who's in the business of practicing or observing these 10 things is called a bodhisattva. So furthermore, virtuous one, bodhisattvas practicing the paramita of giving. So this is number one. It's cut off a little bit. This is dana, giving. Bodhisattvas practicing the paramita of giving regard 10 dharmas as foremost. Number one, the root of faith. Number two, the power of faith. Number three, a joyful mind. Number four, an ever increasing joyful mind. Number five, enriching or maturing sentient beings. Number six, great kindness, <clears throat> maha metta. Number seven, great compassion, maha karunya. Number eight, practicing the four means of unification. Number nine, love of the Dharma. And number 10, searching for omniscience, all knowledge. These are the 10. So these are going to be the first 10 that we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to go through them one by one, some, you know, faster than others, some in a way need, need less explanation than others. Um, again, these are going to be the 10 foremost practices of the practice of giving. Um, I think these are these all 10 of these are interesting. They're particularly interested in regards to this idea of giving, because we we kind of traditionally think of giving as like bestowing of gifts. And so then the idea is you would think, well, the 10 practices of giving is like giving to charities, giving this way, giving that way. <laughs> But this is more subtle than that. And so I do want to go through these kind of carefully, not just to elucidate the 10, but to also gain a, a sort of clearer, better understanding of the paramita of giving. Come on, Coco. Oh. Come on. <laughs> okay. So let's start with the first one, which is this idea of the root of faith. We, we have a lot to unpack just with that idea. And that idea, of course, is that someone who, okay, so someone, a bodhisattva, who is, is interested in the practice of giving, of dana, the bodhisattva who's interested in giving regards one dharma, the, the 10 dharmas as foremost. And one of them is this root of faith. What? Like, how, wait, how does this, and this is going to take a, a little bit of time and mainly because of this word root and then this idea of faith. <laughs> so the root of faith, um, like all wonderful things, Buddhist, there's a list of five roots. Uh, number one is the root of faith. The second is the root of uh, virya determination, drive, or vigor, the root of mindfulness, 
sati, the root of samadhi, concentration, and then finally the root of pranya or wisdom. So those are these five roots. They're going to pop up in our matrix of dharmas. And if if you know if you've been coming to the Dharma Doors classes or you've been listening to Dharma Doors classes, you've probably heard this language, the cultivation or the development of virtuous roots. <laughs> These are the roots. <laughs> These are the cultivation of the development of the virtuous roots. So when, of course, Buddhism talks about roots, they are being uh, metaphorical. They're looking at the mind space as like a mind field, like a field in which you would plant things, seeds, and various seeds lead to little sprouts and also lead to roots. <laughs> And the idea, of course, being that if there's a little sprout of something and you water it, the roots of that will grow deeper and more sturdy. And of course, the plant will grow taller. But if you do not give it the water and attention, it will die. Kind of an idea. So these are the, this is, that's the operating metaphor that we're sort of in the business of tending to these little sprouts or these little roots the root of faith, the root of determination or drive, mindfulness, concentration, and ultimately wisdom. So that's the root idea. And, you know, again, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors, you're probably used to that. And this metaphor of the mind field and sort of cultivating the field of the mind. Sure. <clears throat> but now we get to this idea of faith. Wow. <laughs> What an idea, right? So right off the bat, I, I, I kind of like would love to just disregard that word faith. <laughs> it really is, it's too misleading. Yeah, if you know like your, your deep history of pistis and like Greek and the origin of faith and the Christian tradition, and it might make a little bit of sense. But otherwise, the way this word faith functions in English, it's practically um, what, we're, what we're talking about, first, the first practice here, it's practically the exact opposite of what you would think of in terms of faith. And what I mean by that is this. In Buddhism, this word shraddha, that is usually translated as faith, at least it's what is translated by that Chinese character, which is sometimes translated as faith. This idea of shraddha, or even that, even what they're talking about in Buddhism, the, the deeper sentiment that's involved in it is a, a, a very, deep sense of certainty. You, there, it's not like, uh, eh, maybe, maybe not, maybe. It's you're, you're, you're very clear and certain. That is the root of faith in Buddha. So again, in English, faith is almost like you know, this idea of blind faith, like, well, I, I don't know, but if I, if I pray hard enough and have enough faith, whereas this is actually has nothing to do with, any, you know, any higher power in that sense. It actually has to do with a, a mind or a heart that is not conflicted, is totally integral, integrated in that way. And so there's just this really deep sense of Again, like certainty, clarity and certainty is the best way that I could sort of describe what they're talking about. And yes, yes, of course, it, if, you, if you go poking around, there's a certain sense that it is like a certainty about this Dharma stuff, a, a certainty about this Buddhism stuff, right? And, you know, at first glance, that might be like, huh, a certainty about Buddhism, huh? 
That's that isn't that a little tricky regarding the Dharma? And indeed, it does get a little tricky, but you know, if we appreciate, let's just take a moment and appreciate that the Dharma, this teaching that we're sort of involved in learning about here on Sunday nights, this teaching is about not having a fixed view, not clinging to any particular view. That, that, that the Dharma is suggesting that there is a wisdom and, and ultimately less suffering <laughs> involved if one has a looser grip on ideologies, opinions, positions, all kinds of things, and ultimately not attached to, of course, physical stuff in a deep ownership way and all of that. So the Dharma is tricky to begin with because it's hard to put your finger on exactly what it is other than not being very fixed in one's view. But I think there's a way in which probably everybody in the Zoom room tonight and probably if you watch the or listen to these Dharma doors, there's a way in which you know then that Dharma of non-attachment, even to views. You know the Buddha's suggestion that you got to determine truth for yourself. Nobody gets to determine what is true except for you. What is true for you is, is truth. That's what the Buddha said. But then there's a way, a way that if you can take a step back and be like, wow, that's really great. That's really profound. And have a certain clarity or certainty about that, then you could kind of have faith in the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha in that way. But I went through all of that so that you don't get a, don't get lost. I don't want you clinging on to the Buddha or the Dharma or the Sangha too, too closely, right? <laughs> so the reason why I go through all of that and let me, I'll do the next one. And then in, ca in case there's any questions, please chime in. But the next one is the power of faith. But of course, if we redefine faith, shraddha, if we redefine it the way I do, which is more about this idea of certainty, then it's about this power of certainty. And I mean, at a super, superficial level, this is the power of positive thinking. <laughs> this is very much about that, a very simple idea of, of uh, even in a way, the secret actually, like uh, manifestation and what all the, the new age movement is about. This idea that there is great power in your mind. There is great power in your focus and your, uh, well, there's great, here's the thing, there's great power in your positive and negative mind. Many of us experience the power of our negative mind on a daily basis. I, I definitely experience the power of my negative mind uh, daily. <laughs> In that sense of the experience of doubt, uncertainty, fear, all of these things, yeah. And then I see how powerful my mind is to create my world of anxiety, stress, and so on. But if you flip that, the power of this certainty is, is very much about the latent power you have that can be unlocked through clarity and certainty in that sense. So that's the second one here is a certain uh, power of having such a clear, certain mind. Any questions about these first two? Yeah, no. Are, are you going to eventually give some hint of how that's connected to Donna or because <laughs> or have you already and I missed it? No, no, you're, you're, you're totally right. I should probably, I should probably say that how <laughs> it's connected. Thank you. So Thanks, Noam, by the way, because this is actually a very important point that I almost just ran right by. So, yes, how is this connected to giving? Um, this is going to be very much a, you know, a interpretive commentarial moment. 
Um, here's the thing. Here is the, the thing. Uh, I, th I thought about this too, Gnome. And so I'm actually very glad you asked because I kind of had this whole thing to say. So let's for the moment, let's for the moment take the opposite of dana. Let's take the opposite of giving, right? And so the opposite of being generous and being giving, of course, is sort of that uh, clinging inwardness. We have words in English like hoarding, miserliness, this selfishness, that type of, of um, uh, attitude, or again, disposition towards the world. And of course, the Buddha is saying that by having such a disposition of clinging to self and that you're kind of not only doing yourself a lot of harm, you're doing others harm too. So it's a lose-lose, that, that mode. But here's the thing though, from whence does that mode ar arise? Why? Why would we get so clinging to the self, hoard and be miserly and be selfish? Well, it's certainly part of a worldview, right? It's part of a drishti, part of a worldview. And it's a worldview that's predicated on ideas of, um, well, it is. it has certain ideas about what constitutes safety, security, and things like that, right? So the, the more I have, the safer I am, <laughs> right? As soon as I say it, right, it sounds a little ridiculous, but you know, I know you know what I'm talking about. The worldview or the mentality that says, oh no, the more I have, the safer, because, you know, then I could lose some, but I'd still have some. And, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which th that works out. A worldview and then the miserly, hoarding, selfish clingingness. And what I, I you know, I said it a minute ago, you know, according to the Buddha, that way of being in the world actually causes you fear, stress, anxiety. And ultimately, by being that way in the world, you cause those around you a certain degree of stress and anxiety as well. So again, it's a lose-lose in that way. But here's the thing. It takes a bit of insight, vipassana, a certain about a, amount of wisdom to see that. That, of course, is the, that's the foundation of the Four Noble Truths and why they are noble and why they are true, but also why the Buddha like had to like go through, you know, so much to figure it out and come to tell us about it, which is that it's not exactly obvious to us the way in which that type of clinging leads to the suffering. Again, both for ourselves and others. We, we, think it, we think if I keep holding on, it'll, it'll eventually pay off in some sort of comfort, <laughs> right? So for me, Noam, of course, I said this at the beginning, which was that these, these are not going to sound exactly like form of giving right away. But that's because, of course, the bodhisattva practice is not exactly, it's not only just giving stuff in that way. It's, there's all kinds of ways to give. And so the idea is, is that a bodhisattva that is in the business of practicing dana, that is interested in, as I, as I put it, I think at the begin, at the first class, developing the disposition of generosity. So this is not necessarily about giving, but it's about having an open heart that is generous in all kinds of ways. And I suppose, Noam, where I'm getting at is that it does require a certain degree of faith, maybe even in the old school way. It requires a certain degree of faith to actually believe that being generous is a win-win. 
And so the root of that, the root of that is of the utmost importance of being like, you know what? My genetic evolutionary programming is telling me to look out for number one and telling me that that's how safety and security and happiness has arrived at. But the Buddha is telling me something else. And so it almost is a leap of faith in a way to say, you know what? I'm going to go against my evolutionary biological programming here. <laughs> but there's a great reward by going against your biological evolutionary programming, which is the power of faith. <laughs> so, <laughs> All right. Th thank you, Noam, again, for, for coaxing, coaxing that out of me. I appreciate that. Okay, and by the way, all of these, um, well, no, actually, no, some of them are gonna get more into like the more classic form of giving, but let's move on to number three, unless there's any more, any more questions about those two. Cool. So number three, so number three is actually where uh, the book, they, they did the thing, they did the thing where they, they didn't give you the best translation. So they translate number three is that the bodhisattva, the, the, a, one of the dharmas that is foremost in the practice of giving is aspiration. Aspiration. Unfortunately, that's not, it's not it. Um, so yeah, it's not aspiration at all. There's uh, two beautiful Chinese characters that literally mean happy mind. So what the, Ch the two Chinese characters mean, happy mind, or actually a mind of happiness. Sorry, they're flipped, mind of happiness. If you go grab your dictionary of Chinese Buddhist terms and you look up that Chinese character combination of mind of happiness, there is a technical Sanskrit word that the Buddhists use to describe this, which is the mano birama, which is a joy, a mind of joy, a joyful mind. So the mano, the mano vijnana is the effectively the brain, the central processing unit of the five external sensory organs. So this is specifically referring to the mano vijnana, mano vijnana, and this term, so number three is about developing or having a joyful mano vijnana. I talked about this at, a, at some point, I spoke about this briefly, but this is a very interesting idea in Buddhism and it, it is, doesn't mean aspiration. It doesn't mean aspiration at all. What it means is that we tend to receive happiness and joy from stimulation of our five external sense organs. We like to watch stuff. We like to listen to stuff. We like to smell stuff. We like to eat stuff. And we like to feel stuff, particularly uh, naked bodies. <laughs> So there's these five external organs, the body, right? The eyes, ears, nose, and tongue. And we are in, we tend to receive our joy from those stimulations. The sixth uh, mano vijnana is kind of, again, our central processor of those. And what this is, is basically a very, it's, it's, it's akin to contentment and tranquility, which is, which is basically what, what I mean is um, one does not need external stimulation for uh, joy. That's kind of what's involved in this, but in particular, one receives joy from their own mind from their sixth mano vijnana. They don't need the five external organs. And by the way, I just wanna tell you that one of, one of, the, one of the Buddha's um, 
uh, disciples who was considered like foremost in the development of Manobhirama, this joyful mind, was uh, Madhugayana. And Madhugayana, of course, is known for having the superpowers. And so I make this connection with Madhugayana and the development of superpowers because I want to tell you something very cool about Manobhirama, this idea of uh, the joyful mind. Yeah, yes, it's about um, joy, pretty in, in that sense. It is about joy, but there's also like a little Peter Pan thing going on with this one, like uh, Neverland kind of thing, which is that monks, or I shouldn't say monks, bodhisattvas, whoever, who develop this uh, Manobhirama, the idea is, is that they can basically satisfy their own hunger by pretending to eat. So this is where like the power of the mind becomes like full on to where I no longer need the external apple. I can literally just conjure up an apple in my mano vinyana and then take a nice big bite of the mano vinyana apple and it will uh, satiate me. So just a little, little side note to the, that one. By the way, number four is an ever increasing joyful mind. <laughs> so, so that is, so the Bodhisattva interested in giving is interested in developing this joyful mind. And of course, Noam, just to cut you, cut you off, in case you were gonna ask, well, what does that have to do with giving? The idea of course is, is in the development of that heart of generosity, what, what greatly aids the bodhisattva in the development of such grand generosity is this ability to be content that you don't, it's, it's, it's easier to be, it's easier to be unmiserly when you have such control over the mind in that way. So that's what number three is. And then number four is about ever increasing that, that it's, it's like, but yesterday I thought I had my mind fully mastered and now it's even more mastered <laughs> and it keeps going and going and going. Questions about this Manobhirama? Pretty cool, pretty straightforward, right? Number five, this is where we get more into like the giving in general, like the dana that we would think of. Number five, the Chinese is, is a pretty specific uh, verb for enrich, enriching all sentient beings. The uh, translation just has the classic benefiting all sentient beings. Um, either way, this is about bodhisattvas who are practicing giving. One of the foremost dharmas is a genuine deep concern for the maturation of all sentient beings. This language gets, uh, gets tricky and confusing. It gets even trickier and more confusing when people use save all sentient beings. And that is exactly what it, this is. Not saving, but what I mean is, is that if you have ever, ever in your life heard the phrase, bodhisattvas save sentient beings, like, like they're a messiah, like they're some sort of savior figure, that is a bad translation of this idea, which is that bodhisattvas are very interested in seeing people mature. <laughs> grow up. <laughs> That's what it means. It does not mean save. In many ways, actually, it doesn't even necessarily mean the classic like fairy sentient beings over to nirvana, because that would actually, uh, yeah, I can't, uh, that would actually, of course, put the bodhisattva as like, again, some sort of savior figure where you need the bodhisattva to get to nirvana. 
Bodhisattvas are interested in you getting yourself to nirvana. <laughs> but bodhisattvas are also in, in the business of giving. And one of the ways in which they give is in the helping mature sentient beings, mature all sentient beings, to arrive at a point where you, they, you get yourself liberated. So I want to make that very clear that, you know, Buddhism doesn't start to slip into some weird messianic uh, savior situation here. Not at all. Okay. And, and this, by the way, too, this, this idea of enriching, maturing, um, one way, one way that this happens is through education and teaching. And so, you know, insofar as you see teaching salvific, which I guess it kind of is, then we could talk about saving beings if we think of teaching as a form of salvation in that way. But otherwise, bodhisattvas are, yeah. Everybody good on that idea? Enriching? Oh, no. Full of questions there. Uh, yeah, that's great. Wait. Is it true? Maybe I'm rephrasing what you said, but is it true that there is no way in which someone else can cause your enlightenment other than that they can, you know, cause you to realize something that then enlightens you? Like, the, the, yep. there's no way, right, for even the Buddha, if the Buddha arrived in my living room today, there's nothing he could do to make me enlightened short of teaching me something that then I would enlighten myself. Right. Exactly right, Noam. It's why the, the, the famous line from the Vajra Sutra, when the Buddha says, you know, I, if, even if I saved all sentient beings, in reality, no sentient being would be saved. And that's because of what you just said, you know, because of the ultimate realization here is no self. So there's that conundrum. Right. But it's also deeper than that, in, in that way that it has to sort of arise. It cannot happen any other way. Really, really. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so number six, and number seven, of course, kind of go together. Great kindness and great compassion. Maha metta, maha karuna. I want to just point out that if you are familiar with like the Vimalakirti Sutra or really any Mahayana Sutra, but the Vimalakirti Sutra in particular, they speak a lot about maha metta, not just metta, maha metta, great kindness, great loving kindness. And they speak of not just compassion, but great compassion, maha karunya. And there's probably a lot of different reasons why this is. I last week, um, Last uh, no, part two, by the way, of this sutra was that was a great class last time. We covered a lot of ground. So buried in the, that hour and a half is a quick treatment of the four Brahma Viharas, Metta, Karuna, Mudita, and Upeksha. So I'm not going to go through the more finer nuances of Metta versus Karuna versus Mudita versus Upeksha. But I will take this chance, this opportunity to speak on this idea of maha, great kindness, great compassion. That uh, prefix maha, great. Again, there's a lot of ways to interpret this, but I would I would suggest that uh, last week when I mentioned the four Brahma Viharas that kind of meditation practice in which you kind of imagine a sphere of influence that then in, envelops those around you and you kind of envelop those around you in loving kindness or envelop those around you with compassion or empathic joy. I, when I said that last time, I also mentioned that that was a old meditation practice, like pre-Buddhist, like in the sutras where the Buddha goes through those stages, he says, yeah, this is an old practice. You should do this. It's really helpful. Very quickly though, 
from a bodhisattva Mahayana point of view, there is a way in which imagining that sphere of, in, of influence as arising from a axis in space and time, <laughs> there's a way in which that can, re, can reinforce a sense of self. It can even in a kind of, um, in the way that uh, Nietzsche had a problem with, it can also develop senses of, of self grandeur, if I will, where it's sort of like, I'm so magnanimous that I did my metta practice today. I'm, I'm so kind. I, I extended my loving kindness to the whole planet. <laughs> I'm that kind. <laughs> And there's a way in which the Buddha is kind of sitting there going like, huh, <laughs> I don't know if that's working then. <laughs> so the Maha Karuna, Maha Metta that's spoken about here, one way to read that is that the Bodhisattva is interested in developing loving kindness and compassion, but without a sense of a, an agent or a self that is doing that. And that actually can get tricky, or not tricky, it can get interesting because then the bodhisattva is interested in developing uh, great kindness, not just in themselves. So the idea is like, you know, if I'm at a, if I, let's say I'm at a party uh, one day in the future, and the idea is, is that if there's like somebody over in the corner that's like not having a good time, they're clearly not like exuding loving kindness. They're kind of, then it might be in the Bodhisattva's interest to get that person in a meta mood. So that's where like we're, the Bodhisattva is interested in cultivating loving kindness. Maybe it's coming from here. Maybe it's coming, it's like, it's about getting more loving kindness in the world. That's, Maha metta, or get, getting more compassion in the world. That's Maha Karuna. So, very good with your Maha metta, Maha Karuna. Number eight. Number eight is the key idea that I'm very interested in making more popular. The Bodhisattva who's practicing giving, one of the dharmas they regard as foremost is practicing the four means of unification. This is a, a you know, it's a really slept on uh, Buddhist idea. Um, unfortunately, they translate it as the practice of the four inducements. And yeah, the Sanskrit and the Chinese word I guess they, it means it, it can mean induce, <laughs> but when I read uh, the Bodhisattva practice, the four inducements, <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't even have the foggiest clue, like what that even looks like. It, do I need a, uh, a beaker to do that? <laughs> do, I need a, do I need a microwave? Like what, how does that happen? Whereas the actual language of using or using the term unification, the four means of bringing heart of, of um, creating harmony, the, the Chinese word, which I don't know if you can really see, the Chinese word for this idea, it's a beautiful idea of essentially a conductor uh, because the character has the the character for a hand, which in Chinese writing, whenever the, a character has a hand, it's, it's very informative. And then what it is though, is it's actually three ears. Three ears and a hand are what constitute this character. And so if you go digging in the history of this character, it is very much about harmonizing in that way of like either singing or musical instruments. And so the Bodhisattva is in the business of, of practicing these four means of harmonizing. And the four means of harmonizing are the giving of, of, of actual like gifts. 
number one, the giving of kind speech, kind speech, number two. <clears throat> number three, volunteerism, stepping up to help others with their projects. And number four, the fourth means of unification is cooperation. So by cooperating, volunteering, speaking kindly, and being generous or giving, those are the four means of creating a harmonious society, community, culture, things like that. And the Bodhisattva is in the business of practicing those four. Everybody good with those? I've spoken about those a little bit. I'm, try I'm still trying to find a really nice sutra that's like the four means of unification sutra. That's basically what I'm looking for. So until then, number nine, if you're in the business of practicing dana, then the number nine thing, the number nine dharma that you hold as foremost is love and joy for the dharma. That's it. Love and joy for the Dharma. <laughs> and number 10. Bodhisattvas in the business of practice and giving regard the pursuit of all knowledge as foremost. And I got a lot to say about that last one. So this is, this is an idea. Um, boy, what an idea. Om, omniscience, right? All knowledge. The last paramita is jnana, knowledge. And, and knowledge or jnana, it's pretty much shorthand for sarvanyana, Sarvanyana is the Sanskrit term for omniscience, all knowledge. So all knowledge is the last paramita, the cultivation of this omniscience. But it's also the number 10 foremost dharma, but not um, the knowledge, but the, the pursuit Seeking all knowledge. R right away, you might have this sort of, you know, knee-jerk Dharma reaction where you're like, but wait a minute. But wait a minute. Bodhisattvas should not be seeking all knowledge, right? If you had that <clears throat> knee-jerk Dharma reaction, you're, you're in for a treat. Because... I, I noted in the very, very first class, part one of, of our sutra, I noted that Bodhisattva Akshayamati appears in a number of other sutras. He appears in the Lotus Sutra, appears in the Vimalakirti Sutra, and has a, a whole sutra all of his own. I want to actually read to you very quickly the for, so from the famous chapter nine entering the dharma door of non-duality the famous chapter nine of the vimalakirti sutra i want to read to you akshaya mati bodhisattva's part because he says the bodhisattva akshaya mati declared the dedication of generosity for the sake of attaining omniscience is dualistic. The nature of generosity is itself omniscience. And the nature of omniscience itself is total dedication. Likewise, it is dualistic to dedicate moral discipline, patience, drive or determination, dhyana or meditation, or prajna or wisdom for the sake of attaining omniscience. 
omniscience is the very nature of wisdom and total dedication is the nature of omniscience. Thus, the entrance into this principle of singleness is the entrance into non-duality. I've got to tell you, that particular entryway into the Dharma door of non-duality had always puzzled me a little bit until I read this Akshaya Mati Bodhisattva Sutra. And then I was like, oh, there you have it. <laughs> and what I mean by that, of course, is that, that this language of pursuing omniscience they, they don't think anybody is pursuing anything. It's not about that, right? It's much more, um, and in fact, I want to take a second to sort of just speak about this in giant matrix of Dharma here. So yeah, this is a uh, hundred Dharmas. This is a hundred, 10 by 10, a hundred different practices of the Bodhisattva. This, of course, is from the, we're uh, reading from the Chinese version. And so I've written these kind of two character combinations that sort of embody that practice. Chinese lends itself to such <laughs> uh, things very well. Um, and so what I was hoping actually so number one, I was hoping that when you would see this, you would you would almost like just, it would just feel inexhaustible. That's like the first thing I want. That's the first, I know, I know most of you don't study Chinese. Um, I, I know that this is going on the internet though. And so, uh, you know, there's a whole world out there, but I kind of went through all of this not for you to read all of these, but actually to kind of show you the matrix involved here to give you that feeling of like, oh, this is what they mean by inexhaustible. Wow, this is, it just goes on and it's like fractal. And so that term, that idea of fractal is exactly what is expressed in Akshayamati's part of Vimalakirti that giving and omniscience are not two to see them as two is dualistic. So there's this way, if you would like, to kind of look at this as, you know, that one jewel with a hundred facets. And so that idea is, is that there's like one side of this jewel that's about giving and it has 10 facets. And one of those facets is omniscience. One of those facets is the four means of unification and so on and so forth. And of course, I also mentioned too that the division of uh, the Dharma into 10 and then 10 within 10, that is very much in keeping with the tradition of the Avatamsaka Sutra, the, the Flower Garland Sutra, the whole entire Flower Garland Sutra is in tens. It's all about the 10 stages so this is a sutra in line with that. And there is something very mathematical and fractal about the 10. It's, it's um, <clears throat> very, um, it's kind of metric. It's kind of metric that way, I guess, but okay. So any questions about practicing giving in the Bodhisattva way? <laughs> cool. Then we're gonna move on to number two. Number two is even, it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. It's not as um, hard to make the connection with uh, Sheila moral discipline. Uh, so let me read these 10 real quick and then we'll just go through them. So virtuous one, bodhisattvas 
practicing the paramita of shila, moral discipline, regard 10 dharmas as foremost. Number one, purifying bodily karma. Number two, purifying speech karma. Number three, purifying mental karma. Number four, having a mind without resentment or anger. Number five, purifying and eliminating evil destinies. Number six, avoiding the eight adversities. Number seven, transcending all the stages of voice hearers and Pratekya Bhuttas, solitary enlightened sages. Number eight, securely abiding in Buddha merit or me the merit of the Buddha. Number nine, fulfilling all wishes. And finally, number 10, achieving great devotion, maha pranidana. These are the 10, it says. Okay, number one, two, and three will deal as a, well, it's a package deal. So that is purifying bodily karma, purifying speech karma, purifying mental karma. This is pretty classic as far as Buddhism goes. This is pretty classic as far as Indian religion goes. As far as Indian thinking goes, there is action, otherwise called karma. There is action of the body that has results, right? You, you push something, it moves, right? There is speech karma or speech action, which has results. And there is mental karma, which has results. Being mindful of what you're doing with your body and being mindful of how you use your speech and being mindful of how you use your mind, that is the Buddhist practice of sort of purifying or watching one's karma or watching one's actions. There's a number of things that I could say about these three. One thing that's always interesting to speak or to say is there's a general idea that, um, well, there's actually kind of a saying, which is that the things that we think about tend to be the things that we say, and the things that we talk about and speak about tend to be the things that we do. <laughs> In other words, there's sort of a bubbling up, karmically speaking, from the very subtle realm of thought to the slightly subtle and yet physical realm of speech, which has a weird physical quality, but also a mental quality. And then what we think about and what we talk about eventually bubbles up into the actual physical realities that we live in. Of course, you know, uh, let's just say that you were thinking about moving you first begin with the thought of, huh, I should move, or I need to move, or I'm going to move. And then you start getting on the phone. Hey, everybody, I'm moving. <laughs> hey, everybody, <laughs> you got any boxes? I'm moving. So now you're speaking it. Guess what? In a, in a month from now, you're going to be looking around in an entirely new place, and it should be no mystery how you got there because you thought about it and you talked about it and then you did it. <laughs> so that's important in, in terms of watching our karma is basically noticing that there's a chain reaction from thought to speech to manifest reality. And therefore you could 
greatly affect your manifest reality by beginning on the mind. Traditionally, of course, when we're talking about shila, moral discipline, and we're talking about the body, bodily karma, traditionally we're talking about nonviolence, non-killing, non-stealing, that type of karma. When we talk about speech karma, we're traditionally talking about lying, harsh speech, malicious speech, divisive speech, and purifying speech is avoiding divisive speech, harmful speech, and malicious speech, and false speech. And then mental karma is the same way as far as having uh, greed, ide greedy ideas, angry, anger-filled ideas, ideas like that. Purifying mental karma is diminishing and getting rid of such anger, greed, greedy filled thoughts like that. In the Mahayana tradition, and particularly the Bodhisattva path, purifying bodily karma is a little more complicated than just not stealing. <laughs> It goes on and on and on. And what I mean by that is, is that, um, well, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go too deep into this. But of course, if you're, if, you're, if you're listening to this, then you already know about there's no self. You already know about that one, right? The no self thing. And so the idea is, is that from the Bodhisattva point of view, they're like one, one, way to put it is that the bodhisattva is not just like purifying bodily karma in terms of good action bad action they would ultimately be purifying them themselves careful careful but they would be purifying themselves of the very attachment to this physical body at the expense of the neglect of the, all the other body. So again, the Bodhisattva is not interested in, in reaffirming this axis in space and time, but is still very interested in purifying bodily karma. <laughs> same goes for speech, same goes for the mind. It's a much more, um, interminable, could I say that? There's no end to this practice, interminable. Is that what that is? That, that what that means, right? So this is much more interminable that way, where it, you know you just keep purifying, keep purifying in that sense. In the old school Buddhist way, there was sort of a terminus to this. You you actually had a certain number of unwholesome roots, and as soon as like you clipped that last little root, woo, you made it, Arhat. Woo, you did it. The Bodhisattva path, again, is a little more nuanced than that and in that sense, interminable. Questions about body karma, speech karma, or mind karma, or purifying those. Cool. Number four is just, it's the most direct, right? Having a mind without resentment or anger. Yeah. Practice that. <laughs> Good luck. Number five. <laughs> Number five is an interesting one. So it gets a little weird. This one is about uh, purifying and eliminating the the chinese actually says purifying and then eliminating evil destinations so by evil destinations we are referring to the three lower rebirths of being a hell dweller a hungry ghost or an animal if we want we could substitute the asuras and we could put the animals as a higher rebirth if you want, it's fine. But the idea is, is that there's a general idea 
that there are these not so great rebirths. Let's take, just for the moment, let's take that terrible state of being a hungry ghost, a preta. So I've, I've, said, I've talked about this in so many Dharma talks, but yes, of course, this is part of the general Buddhist worldview, the cycle of death, birth, and rebirth, the idea that you, by virtue of hearing this, seem to have been reborn as a human this time around. And the general idea is that based on your body, speech, and mind karma, you will either be reborn as a human again, maybe as an uh, upper rebirth, as a god, or a lower rebirth, hell dweller or a ghost or something. But in my previous Dharma talks, I've described how the Mahayana Buddhist tradition does not necessarily see these as future fates and future rebirths, they're actually ways to describe states of mind. And that one could find oneself very easily being reborn as a hungry ghost. So what I mean by that is, is that a hungry ghost is said to be this, you know, insatiably hungry creature. But the problem with this hunger that this hungry goat, they're called hungry ghosts because they have this insatiable hunger. But the problem is they can't satiate it. Uh, they say actually that their throats are too small. And so they cram the food in their mouth, but it doesn't actually satisfy them. There have been, uh, I have seen other Dharma teachers liken the state of the hungry ghost to that of the someone with a chemical addiction where no, no amount of it satisfies me. I need more and more. That is a, it's a bad state to be in. The unsatisfiable state of an addict or something like that is a very bad mental state to be in. And the idea is, is that if you find yourself reborn in a situation where you're not getting, you know, the satisfaction that you think you deserve from this in a way. And so it's like, oh no, one more, one more bite, one more pill, one more whatever will do it that kind of endless pursuit of satisfaction is kind of like being reborn as a hungry ghost. It's one of these evil destinies. I went, I went through that kind of description of this so that you might understand that a bodhisattva who's in the business of purifying and even eventually getting rid of those types of states that might make more sense if you think of it as, oh, now the bodhisattva is a recovery specialist and is deeply interested in ridding the world of that type of chemical dependency. That would just be one tiny small example of how to read this particular practice, which is the bodhisattva is interested in eliminating evil destinies or evil states. I've also in the past, other Dharma talks, I, you know, the descriptions of hell sound a lot like being in a slave, indentured servant, having no freedom, being whipped, laboring all the time. And so once again, the Bodhisattva would be definitely in the business of eliminating slavery in the world that still very much exists. So things like that. Questions about number five? Number six is sort of akin to that. Um, it's this idea of avoiding the eight adversities. There's this thing in Buddhism as well. It's kind of up there with the, the various rebirths. And there's these eight they're called the eight unfortunate 
situations or the eight adverse situations. And uh, most of them are actually, or not most of them, but being reborn as a hungry ghost is considered one of the adversities. Being reborn as a, as a hell dweller is one of the adversities. But interestingly, things like being born in a world where there's no Dharma, like they just, they never heard of the Buddha, they never heard of the Dharma. That's one of the adverse situations. Being reborn in a country at war is considered one of the adversities or one of the adverse situations. And so there are these eight adverse situations that the Bodhisattva is actually in the, is interested in avoiding the, themselves in a way. <laughs> they, they don't want to find themselves necessarily in, in, a, in a place where there's no Dharma or in a place where there's war. And of course, the way to avoid that is through moral discipline in, in all of the ways described already. Everybody okay with that one? Five and six. Cool. Michael? Yeah, no. Why is that one not about also keeping others from being? Oh, it's only in the language, the literal verb that it seems like it's more personal. Yeah. But from a larger point of view, no, absolutely. It's about hoping nobody goes there in that way, for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's just that the other one, number five, was more explicitly somehow about doing it for other people. So number seven, also going to be pertaining to the Bodhisattva themselves. Number seven is actually this idea of transcending all the stages of voice hearers, shravakas, or pratekya bhutas, solitary enlightened ones. We've heard about these characters, the Shravaka, the voice hearer. That is a kind of a character in Buddhism that represents this kind of old school form of Buddhism, the more deeply monastic path. The Pratekya Buddha, of course, is the solitary enlightened one who basically figures out dependent origination all by themselves and therefore is liberated but does not teach anybody about it. That's pretty much the defining characteristic of a Pratekya Buddha. Both the Shravaka and the Pratekya Buddha in their respective traditions have these various stages for the uh, Shravaka, for the voice hearer, it's the stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, Arhat, this sort of a four stages of the arhat. Um, I forget what the Pratekya Buddha stages are right now, but there are these delineated stages of Pratekya Buddhahood. Number seven here is saying that the Bodhisattva actually is in the business of transcending all the stages of the Shravaka and the Pratekya Buddha. All in the guise of moral discipline right? There's a lot to this. I've actually kind of already alluded to it several times. W one of the initial reasons why the Bodhisattva would be, in would be interested in transcending those stages is because, like I said a few times, those stages tend to reinforce notions of self, or at least they have a... Um, they just have a kind of way in which that can happen. And as I've mentioned in many, many Dharma talks, the hierarchy of stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arhat, within the Buddhist tradition, the early days of Buddhism, that hierarchy seems to have created a lot of problems. <laughs> and so um, like a lot of hierarchies, like a lot of those types of institutional hierarchies, I read this one as the Bodhisattva is in the business of not having anything to do with that type of uh, institutional hierarchical way of thinking. That's how I read number seven. Bodhisattva is in the business of transcending the stages of Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas. 
Everybody good with that one? Cool. Number eight, sec the language, how do they translate it? Abiding securely in the Buddha's merit. Yeah, securely abiding in the Buddha merit. So that's the number eight. Merit, of course, or punya, that's what we've been talking about this whole time regarding um, uh, body, speech, and mind karma, and then rebirth, and this idea of like um, the sort of metaphysical, the metaphysical jelly that makes that happen, right? The metaphysical jelly of reincarnation and rebirth is punya, merit. The idea is the more, <clears throat> excuse me, the more merit you accumulate, the better your rebirth. The more demerit, the more bad points you accumulate, the lower your rebirth. This actually is, is ultimately not going to be talking about it that way. I wanted to say though that, yeah, uh, so abiding securely in Buddha merit, when we talk about Buddha merit, it, it means we're not talking about the, the, the other kind of merit that can actually be like calculated by like a God or Yama and then like uh, doled out with punishment and reward. We're not talking about that kind of merit. Buddha merit is, well, just for the sake of time, Buddha merit is like wisdom. You, you, enlightenment. This is not brownie points. So first of all, we're not talking about brownie points. And then the, the first part of this, abiding securely in Buddha merit. There's a lot to that as well. Um, it's sort of, um, well, it's sort of twofold actually one way is sort of that if you if you go all the way back to the the beginning of this dharma talk where i was talking about the um the type of giving of 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 compassion or kindness where it's like i gave it to you and so i get the brownie points cuz i gave you the thing that's the old kind of merit not that's not buddha merit so that idea of, of um, abiding securely in selfless or yeah, abiding securely in selfless merit. And what that means, of course, is, is like resting securely in this idea of, of like, I, I, yeah, I said it at the beginning, resting securely in this idea that if you don't just look out for number one, it's okay, <laughs> right? Because the other kind of merit is about you looking out for your rebirth. And so you accumulate all the good brownie points and then by you go to heaven or whatever. This is not talking about that. This is talking about that deeper, almost wisdom in that way. So Buddha merit, and then securely abiding in that Buddha merit, I wanna remind you that at the opening poem, when the Buddha first lays out all of the 10, the way that he described moral discipline, a bodhisattva that had such uh, virtuous roots, that they had virtuous roots that were foundational like the earth, securing all things. That was the metaphor the Buddha used that the bodhisattva or the one who uh, is deeply observed in moral discipline becomes this kind of like a rock, like this foundation. It's a very interesting idea. And that has to do with this idea of securely abiding in Buddha merit. Number nine, number nine's the kind of the, the oddball it just says, they have it as, yeah, the fulfillment of all wishes, fulfilling all wishes, right? So uh, it's, it's funny, I just, 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 just thought of that. 
Um, there's a funny thing about fulfilling all wish wishes. There's a, a, a way to say that in Sanskrit. It's Siddhartha. The name, the Buddha's name, Siddhartha, means wish fulfilled. Fulfiller of, uh, fulfill, or yeah, not fulfiller of wishes, actually wish fulfilled. So there's an interesting play going on there, I would imagine. This is an interesting one. It would seem, based on the language, that the bodhisattva practicing moral discipline down here at number nine, fulfilling wishes, that they're actually in the business of fulfilling other people's wishes. And what that would mean is it, it kind of sounds like giving. And of course, this is a, a fractal. So these are all interrelated in that way. But the idea is, is that because the Bodhisattva is sort of really deeply involved in a selfless practice that way, they themselves sort of don't have such aspirations or wishes in that way. But then there's all anybody that they might encounter, and they might have a wish or a desire. And the Bodhisattva is in the business of fulfilling those people's wishes and desires. And there's a number of reasons why they might be involved in that. But I kind of just want to leave it there. By the way, in terms of the way that this practice is spoken about in other sutras, this could take all kinds of forms, this fulfilling people's wishes. It, it could really be like uh, um, uh, playing a musical instrument. That could be fulfilling people's wishes in that way. Or it could be something else entirely different. <laughs> it, it really, and this is where we, we haven't talked about upaya tonight, but that idea of skillful means, right? But that idea of skillful means is deeply involved in this idea of fulfilling wishes because one would need to be skillful at doing that. So any questions about that one? I know, again, that one's kind of a little, seems a little odd at first if you're not really familiar with the larger Bodhisattva practice of sort of helping everybody out. <laughs> okay, sweet. So we'll do one more. This is an interesting one, number 10. Um, I'm curious what they have. Uh, yeah, so they did it with this way. So the fulfillment of great vows. Um, I am not the biggest fan of translating this word as vow. Um, the word yeah, it's funny. The word in Chinese actually is, is um, it's very related to the will and like willpower, interestingly. And, but in, in Buddhism, it, it is this idea of, um, well, ultimately, I think I translate it as devotion. It's a paramita itself, this pranidana. This is the word that we're talking about. So a bodhisattva practicing the 10 aspects of moral discipline, the 10th dharma they regard as foremost is developing or achieving a state of great pranidana. Pranidana, again, can mean devotion. It kind of has this, um, I mentioned this probably last week, but it has a kind of connotation of surrendering oneself to a higher power. But I said last week, the higher power is your most enlightened self. So you're kind of surrendering to your greater Buddha self in a way, not God, not a larger, you know, higher power in that way. That's what pranidana is, this kind of surrendering of the ego, surrendering of the small self in that way. The Bodhisattva here is achieving this great pranidana. And what 
the reason why this goes with number nine, well, it goes with all of them, but it, it's, it's uh, related to number nine. So we've encountered this Maha Pranidhana in a previous sutra. It was in the sutra about the girl bodhisattva. I forget her name. There's been so many of these great sutras. There was this uh, bodhisattva about a young girl, eight years old. Great sutra um, explains the Dharma to all of these shravakas and bodhisattvas. And then by the power of her maha pranidhana, she changes herself into this giant gold being. And that is a, a, a exercise or a practice or a, 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 an example of this great devotion. And so what I mean is, is that this is kind of going back to what I was saying before about the, the power of the mind, power of positive thinking, all of that. The idea is, is that in the Bodhisattva practice, by making this great surrender, this pranidhana, it imbues one with tremendous willpower, but not willpower like, I can endure it. I can endure it. I, I can last another minute. Not that kind of willpower, but the actual like manifesting things in reality willpower. <laughs> and so this is directly related to number nine, because let's just say you wanted to hear a song. By the power of my pranidhana, I could. Yeah, I'll put it to you that way. Let's say, let's say I was like super bodhisattva and let's say I knew it would like make your day to hear a, 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 a song played on the guitar, but I don't play the guitar. I've never played the guitar. I've never learned to play the, the guitar, but through the power of my great vow, by the power of my great pranidhana, I could bust out a song for you. And it, but it wouldn't be by my will, it would be by the will of this sort of transcendental power of surrender. That's kind of a fun example of, and things like that are what are talked about in the sutras. And that would be an example of it. Again, where I don't have any prior training, but just by the power of will alone, I could bring about the thing that would satisfy you or fulfill your wishes in that way. So those are the 10. And that's time. So I'm gonna call it there, unless there's any questions or comments, or answers, ideas, epiphanies. Michael, it's Noe. Hey, Noe. Yes. Um, it, it, it's 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 a bit it's a bit uh, striving. It comes off for me. This all of this is like, and and it perhaps it's just me, but it's like, well, this is what you do. This is what you do. This is what you do, and then you'll be perfect. And and yet that's not what you do. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 unfortunately. Uh, it sounds like, and if you, you know, this, this is a bubble. It's a, a, a moment. And, and what comes next? Who knows? The Buddha? Mm -hmm. Where's the Dharma? Where's the Buddha? Where, mm -hmm. where is all of this? Mm -hmm. But at this moment, so I, I'm, I'm afraid for me this evening, it came off as striving. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'll have to sit with that and examine that that uh, idea because, yeah, I'll just have to sit with that because that's the hungry ghost, mm. that even the Dharma is, 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 uh, is a hell, mm. Mm -hmm. can be a hell if, if misinterpreted, perhaps. So I'll have to examine that for myself. 
but it did come off that way. I needed to speak up. Yeah, no, I'm glad you did. No, you know, no, and I do. I, I, I know what you're responding to. I, I, or I think I do. I, 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 I know, and I really think that. Yeah, I think the thing that I would really like to to say to try to simplify this and to try to assuage uh, Noe's kind of concern here about the striviness of all this. The one thing that I really, you know, I kept emphasizing it tonight is how from the Bodhisattva point of view, how, so we talked about these 20 dharmas tonight and each one of them I tried to, you know, do my best dharmically speaking in terms of putting them as a selfless practice. That the that everything was directed towards the other. Mm -hmm. And and what I mean by that, Noe, is is like I think that I really, really hear you, Noe, and I want to really give you a, a good response to this, but I really think that for creatures and beings such as, our, as ourselves that are culturally and otherwise programmed to really just look out for themselves, to really be selfish, we're in a sense encouraged to do that, we're again kind of given a worldview that sort of tells us that you know the whoever you know dies with the most toys wins or whatever the mentality is but that idea mm -hmm. and by being so programmed that way there's a way that you can see this as a deprogramming of a habitual being and so it's not like the the problem no is that we are striving <laughs> mm -hmm. and and this is sort of what it looks like to not do that mm -hmm. and and be, again because all of these are coming from a selfless place and i don't say that in terms of anatman selflessness i mean it more in terms of an altruistic that these mm -hmm. are coming from a sense of um um, well, again, even if we just go back to not even the 10, but just the paramita of giving, the idea is, is that we are programmed to not do that. <laughs> we are basically programmed mm -hmm. to hoard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so the practice of giving needs to sort of be encouraged in that way. And right in there, right there, Noe, I can already see it where it's like, yeah, it can so become a goal and become striving and all of that. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's a very nuanced thing about, um, well, it's very nuanced about what I just said, that, that striving is, is, is I'll make more money next year, then I'll be happy, then I'll be safe, then I'll be secure. Right, that, that idea of like, what, what will do it? But all of that is the striving. And there's, you know, there's books upon books for how to make money and how to be successful and how to do this and how to do that. And 10 point plans, making your life a better, da, 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 and all of these things and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And so this is, you know, this is a, a, a certain presentation of the Dharma <laughs> in this really kind of, in intensely enumerated way mm -hmm. but no i don't want you to get like um you know i don't want you to mistake this all of this for that type of striving although again i do feel you about why and and how that mm -hmm. came about it's Fred, thank you the word that keeps coming to mind for me is letting go yeah. as opposed to striving absolutely yeah Absolutely. But I got, and again, I think we need some, uh, the, we need some advice from the boot on how to do that. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the, the, yeah, because this is that. If you do this, it gets that. If you do this, it gets that. In your next life, in your next life, in your next, you know, it, it's pulling in a lot of, of stuff from before the Buddha, or the, you know, the philosophy. And, and at some points it felt like, oh my goodness, this is a religion. Mm. This, these are the things that it, it, it comes across as a religion. And, and it's not my view. <laughs> oh yeah no and, yeah. And, and again there's so many things here that are running you know they're like like um for example the idea of faith it's it's problematic that they translate it as faith because it kind of mm -hmm. it it uh it would encourage the way that you're thinking noe when really Correct. this is when really this is actually trying to to do the exact opposite yes so thank you uh, thank you michael oh uh, thank you noe any other questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right. So then next week, we'll cover some more of these dharmas, doing a deeper dive into our patience, determination, and probably even dhyana. So please uh, come back next week for that. And by the way, this Friday, this Friday, I'm giving a special visual presentation for the San Francisco Dharma Collective at 7.30. Um, it's a talk I've never given before, although I have taught this, but I've never given like a presentation on it. And it's basically the history of people trying to classify the teachings of the Buddha whether it's the Vinaya, the Abhidharma and the Dharma, or whether it's this school versus that school, or whether it's Mahayana versus Theravada, all of these different ways that, you know, because there's so many types of Buddhisms, there's been a lot of different attempts to categorize all these teachings. And so this is going to be a fun presentation on all the different ways people have tried to do that, which also becomes just a, <clears throat> a great introduction to the different types of Buddhism in the world. So I hope to see you on Friday at 7.30, otherwise next Sunday at 7.00.